around the ninth hour, Jesus shouted in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This fourth teaching of Jesus in his sermon from the cross gives voice to the human longing for God, the God who so often seems far away. The next word of Jesus' sermon will be the voice of God longing for people who too often take themselves away. Eli, Eli, lamak sabachthani. Why art thou so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning, my God, I cry by day but thou dost not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Thou art holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In thee our fathers trusted. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. To thee they cried, and were saved. In thee they trusted, and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, and no man scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet thou art he who took me from the womb. Thou didst keep me safe upon my mother's breasts. Upon thee I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, thou hast been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls, Bashing surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And thou dost not leave me. Thou dost lay me in the dust of death. Yea, dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all of my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my raiment they cast lots. But thou, O Lord, be not far off, O thou my aid, hasten to my aid. So the 22nd Psalm. We know well the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. But Psalm 22 is the psalm that allowed the Christians to make sense of how their Savior, how their Messiah could die like that. You know, 
For 12 years, I lived in a beautiful parish in Edmonton, Annunciation Parish. When I got there, it was a strange place. I moved in with a good Polish priest. He taught me lots of things, Andrew Bogdanovich. Andrew taught me how to, about confessions, told me how to hear confessions. He told me the key to making confessions happen. He said, tell me, how would you make confessions happen in a parish? And I said, I preach and do all these sorts of things and encourage people to come. And he said, well, when I was in Poland, I had a good, tough pastor named Korczynski. And Father Korczynski said, you, how do you make confessions happen? Excuse my Polish accent. How do you make confessions happen? And Father Andrew said, well, in the seminary we learn to teach. Do all he says, wrong. You sit on your butt in the confessional and you wait for them to come. <laughs> That's right. You show up. When I was a young priest 30 years ago, we didn't show up for confession. Confession had been a thing of the past. It was filled with guilt, right? I was ordained into a strange, self-absorbed transition time, and I'm ever thankful to my parents and all the people who remained faithful through all of that for, I would not be here were not for their faith. But there was this sense that somehow confession was all about guilt and negativity. And yeah, there was, there was a harsh kind of Catholicism. There is a reason, as I've said before, that Quebec is empty. There was almost Calvinist Catholicism. Le petit Jésus va tu punir. Little Jesus is going to punish you. Bad person. God's waiting to put you into hell. And they reacted against that. So too in this parish that I was in, Annunciation, they have a magnificent crucifix, the corpus of which is 12 feet high, and it was on the back, because they had moved it out of the sanctuary and put up a wall with an empty cutout with fluorescent lights of a cross and moved the crucifix. I asked why. Well, we were told that that was kind of depressing and the church had moved beyond that. So they moved it, put up a fluorescent empty space. Good symbol. And I preached about that for 10 years. Got myself into trouble. Because that cross is not a sign of mean God making people suffer and obey. It is the place in which our God shows us who God is. For our God is love. And love is the act of the will of saying to the other, for you I want good. Love's first word is not as in English, I love you. It is as in Italian. Ti voglio bene. It is you I want good for. God is outpouring love. I have seen over and over and over again that kind of love in God's people 
especially in the parents and families of those who have mental illness in their family. And you know which family that is? Every family. Whenever I ask someone who the mentally ill person is in their family, and they say, we don't have anyone mentally ill, I know I'm talking to the mentally ill person. Our brains are so finely tuned and can so easily go out of whack. And one of the most horrible things to experience, and I know it from the inside, for I am one who suffers like that, is depression. To have no taste of anything. To face complete and utter bleakness. How loved I was by those who stood by me. How loved are those parents who with children who have the burden of schizophrenia, bipolarity, narcissistic disorder, chronic depression, who stay with loving, suffering with the broken one. And Jesus, who is God's love made flesh on the cross goes to the place of complete emptiness. Jesus goes to the place, the unimaginable place, where God is felt to be not. He goes to the godless place. He had prayed Psalm 22 all of his life. Jesus was a man of the Psalms. Psalms, the Hallel Psalms, were what he and his disciples prayed as they went into the Mount of Olives praising God. He had prayed this psalm over and over again in his life. And so, on the cross, he prays this psalm. And he knows all that this psalm means. The agony of abandonment, of depression, of frustration, of emptiness. My God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? And this, not from a human who's in and out and in and out of attention to God. Not from the lips of someone who every so often turns to God. This, from the one who always knew from the moment of conception in the depth of his being that he was the son of the Abba. He who could pray Abba as no one had ever prayed before. No one had ever said, Daddy, Abba. And now, out of obedience to the Abba, who in love wants no emptiness, no hell, no depression, no agony, to be godless anymore. He goes to the place 
where he cries out, Abba. And there is nothing. And silence. And into that place, the shuffling cry of hundreds of Jews walking into ovens, of parents staying up late wondering where their child is now, of people cast out from places of care to wander misunderstood as they wrestle with pain inside that no one can see, pushed out into towers when people cannot see them. Children butchered, mocked, of nations crying out in desperation. All of that all of that sin and brokenness and hurt is in the silence of Jesus who cries out, Abba, and hears nothing. This is beyond the mind or the feelings of you or I. Before this, we can only bow our heads. For every heartbroken cry, every no we say, and hear every pain we feel or fear is there in the silence of the Abba. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me?